we had three studios and we had 80 teachers and like we had 150 people working for Skyting and we were like that's not really doable to like keep going in this big way and the first step really was people in France and London and like how can I practice skyting I can't find your methodology anywhere here so it really was like how do we reach more people without going to the people physically so we were like instead of opening a studio in LA or Austin which we seriously considered we're like let's pour our resources to trying skyting TV this is Sarb to Storefront the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth Today's guests are Chrissy Jones and Chloe Kernahan, co-founders of Sky Tang Yoga. Chrissy and Chloe began with a single brick and mortar studio in New York City, but their following quickly outgrew their studio's capacity. So naturally, they expanded into more locations. But just as it's difficult to keep expanding into new studios, it's also tough to find great teachers to staff them. To be fair, this is a great problem to have. The only real solution was to leverage their instruction style and name into an online platform. And in a moment of unpredictably brilliant timing, they launched this platform a few months before COVID hit and everything switched to be an online platform. So listen in as we cover everything from how taking a hit in video quality during the pandemic actually taught them how to create more engaging videos, how they plan to compete with industry titans like Peloton, and how switching from an analog studio to a digital space wasn't exactly as straightforward as they'd hoped. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask. And we're back. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Sky Ting. Thank you guys for joining. Chrissy, please tell us a little bit about your company. Thanks for having us, first of all. Very thrilled to be here. Sky Ting is a yoga center, was a yoga center in New York City. We opened in 2015 and grew our physical locations to three studios in New York City, in Tribeca, Chinatown, and Brooklyn. And then we were like, what else are we gonna do? Let's try this online thing. So we launched Sky Ting TV in 2019, which is our online platform with a bunch of yoga classes, and that was our way to reach more people without opening a bunch of brick and mortar studios. And luckily, we had that set up for dun dun dun, 2020, March hit, and Sky Ting TV, which was our side hustle, became our only hustle. And that's kind of still where we are now. We haven't opened our physical locations yet in New York City, as of now, we can have 30% capacity. So to turn on the whole yoga studio machine at 30%, it doesn't really make sense for us. And we're keeping on with the online platform for now. I love it. We're gonna jump into that, but let's go to the beginning. So when you guys first decided to move into brick and mortar, what was, let's say, like if I were to walk into a Skyting location, what would be different? What were you guys trying to solve in the market that you guys weren't seeing? What What was your special take you were trying to bring to the market? I think probably the, the biggest differentiator for Skyting, especially when we first opened, which was 2015. So that's, you know, a few years ago now, again, yeah. as we get older, um, we put design as one of our like primary foundational principles as to like how we wanted the studio to run and so that translated into the actual spaces into you know our instagram into our newsletters basically any communication skyting had with the world we had a lens of just creativity infused into it i think in a way that other studios weren't necessarily considering so much at the time. And so a Skyting space, our first location in Chinatown, it was plant filled. We had really big windows. It was very light filled as well. We were at the back of kind of like a nondescript building in Chinatown, like two doors down from a Popeye's. So not necessarily like a area that you would expect a studio like this to even exist, but you'd go into an elevator, go up, and our studio was like two floors. And to get to the second floor, you had to go through an external fire escape that had like plants all over it as well. And so it was just like really special and, and I think a different experience for most New Yorkers because a lot of yoga studios at that point, because of the real estate market, were like basement studios, you know, or 
kind of like not the top tier pick, but we were able to find this little gem of a spot. And then all of our other studios after that, as well as, you know, our website and how we try and gear even teachers now filming in their homes in the pandemic we always try and steer them towards this sort of similar kind of base very clean aesthetic that's become kind of signature for us i like that and there's also something about disconnecting if there's like a journey involved in getting to a space and so that fire exit wall seemingly crazy it's probably an opportunity for you to like literally disconnect from your job or your phone and now you're into like you're transformed into this place where you can have some peace. Is there anything very early on that you guys learned about your customers that maybe surprised you? A lot of our customers were people that weren't yoga people at all. Okay. Like they were like, oh, I never liked yoga until I tried sky tang. And we're like, we always say, well, you just haven't found the right teacher. Like if it's not fun or exciting, then it's boring. Like there's nothing worse than like going to a yoga class and like being like, what was that? Or like, that wasn't very fun. I don't really know what I was doing. So we kind of created our own method based on accessibility and like teaching to a normal person that just uses yoga for tools to handle life with more ease rather than teaching yoga for like yoga fanatics. So I think that style really invited a wide range of humans to our studio. So we were teaching like older people, young people, kids, artists. Yeah, a lot of people who've never done yoga before but then became addicted to this methodology. So that's kind of our special sauce is like accessibility and like making the practice more fun and light and enjoyable. If all these people were formerly non-yoga practitioners, how did you reach them? Were you involved in a community outreach program? Was it advertising? Was it word of mouth? Because for me, that's the hardest thing is like, if, if these people have never done yoga before, what's the incentive to get them to start? How did you overcome that obstacle? I think because of our studio's original location, I think that was like, you know, in a way a boon for us because we were down in the Chinatown neighborhood, which at that point didn't really have much as far as fitness, boutique fitness, even gyms. There were very, very few six years ago when we opened. And so we didn't do any kind of paid advertising for the first basically like five years of being open, right, Chrissy? All of our brick and mortar spaces were all super organic in how they grew. And, you know, we did get some very generous write-ups in nice magazines that were like, try this space out, which of course helps to a degree. But I think also just the, the community feeling that was like inherently embedded in our spaces, let the word of mouth be our strongest asset as far as community growth and just getting people in the door and like tagging on to what Chrissy said in the last question what was interesting I think also is like most studios it's like the pre-work or the post-work that are the most popular classes right it's like people that have a nine-to-five job usually try and fit it in around their busy schedules but especially at our Chinatown location we always had people in the midday classes as well, which just I think speaks to like who was living in the neighborhood um, and who had, was interested in checking this out. And so that really, I think also helped grow who was coming in because like Chrissy said, we had like artists that were, you know, just freelance that could come in at any time of day. We had like old people that didn't work anymore that were from the neighborhood that were just popping in for a class. And so it was really like just a beautiful organic growth that happened. I've taken some yoga and my favorite line is always a drop of water is enough to curve a stone or something like something like that. <laughs> like a drop of water a day is enough to. I'm going to use stone. that next class I teach. Thank you. I say it all the time. Like when people are upset or like I'll say to my wife, if, if something's going wrong about like, you know, how just keep the action going. And she's like, that's the dumbest thing. No one believes that. And I'm like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's true, but it's, I love it. I, I did Bikram for a little while while I was living in Boston because it's the only thing that makes you sweat while it's like, you know, 10 degrees outside in the wintertime. Our teacher says every cell matters. Even your pinky toe matters. That's very true. What's the name? What's in the name? What does Sky Ting mean? Sky Ting is an homage to our neighborhood. It's a Chinese word that means the room of or the place of the sky. So our first location was in the sky with skylights on the seventh floor, very like ethereal feeling. Um, and also our methodology is a little bit different. It's 
based in Katona Yoga, which is, you know, a yoga term you guys probably don't know. It's a little methodology in New York proper. Our teacher, Naveen Mashan, developed her own style of yoga that she taught Chloe and I. And it's more based in Taoism and Chinese medicine than anything else. So we didn't want to use a, a name that was like Chrissy and Chloe Yoga or an Indian name, which is, you know, what most yoga studios are named after, the Indian lineage. So we wanted to pay homage to our teacher and the neighborhood we were in, and it just made sense with our space. Was the hard part of this the teachers, like getting them to organize or just the repetitiveness of maybe getting multiple teachers to just kind of do the same thing? Like what was the hard part of scaling it from the brick and mortar side? I mean, the first studio we were lucky, like we were yoga teachers before we opened a studio. And so we had a network of teachers that we were, you know, very close friends with. And so we invited them to start our space. But of course, that was one space with, you know, maybe six classes at most a day. But when we started expanding our second location, we had two classrooms. So that meant basically we were tripling the number of classes total. And then, of course, we opened a third space. And so I think what we did in our, with our second location was we started a yoga teacher training program, which then helped us to not only you know support the business, obviously, because that's another source of income, but also really train and prime teachers that were fluent in our methodology and like what we you know really wanted to support and teach in a fresh new way. And so while we constantly were definitely auditioning teachers from outside around New York City, it was also really nice to create not like a, a totally closed ecosystem loop, but at least be able to like bring people through like the journey of advancing your yoga practice from being a student to a serious student to then a trainee to then fully teaching. And we still have on our schedule a lot of those teachers like that are now a few years in and are really amazing. That says a lot about you guys. I mean, that's kind of the, that's the hardest part, I think, is just keeping these people on your side and with you and in the momentum, especially as you guys grow. You guys remind me so much of the Soul Cycle story in some way, New York based, except they had a kind of a breakup with one of their teachers that created the methodology from the Business Partner Foundation. So as you guys are up, you guys 2015, everything's moving forward. 2019, you decide, a genius move to spread COVID to everybody while you're launching your wonderful online program. But no, but no, let's go back to it. So how did you guys decide, okay, because brick and mortar is a slow strategy. That's the issue with it. Like I'm a tech guy, I used to be in tech. And so brick and mortar is like, it's, it's, you're talking about decades and they just drive you crazy. But moving online, you can, you can create some repetition, you can create some videos. And so what was the idea that made you want to go online? And then what was your first step, right? Everyone thinks, oh, let's go with an app. Maybe for you guys, it might have been YouTube. But the, what was like the first thing you guys said, okay, let's try this in an online setting? I think the first thing for us was like, we had three studios and we had 80 teachers and like we had 150 people working for SkyTing and we were like, that's not really doable to like keep going in this big way. And the first step really was people in France and London and like, how can I practice skyting? I can't find your methodology anywhere here. Like we love your blend of Katona yoga and vinyasa. So it really was like, how do we reach more people without going to the people physically? So we were like, instead of opening a studio in LA or Austin, which we seriously considered, we're like, let's pour our resources to trying SkyTing TV. And our angle was to make the videos really cinematic and beautiful and design forward, just like the rest of our studio. Because a lot of online yoga things at the time were like a camera at the back of the room and like quality super low. So we were like, let's just make like 20 highly beautiful videos and launch a little online thing. So we started with 20 gorgeous videos, 2019. And then we were like, okay, we got to film these from home. Quality's going down just for COVID. Um, and kind of like did that for a few months and then got back in the studio eventually. But yeah, our goal with it was to spread these practical wellness tools and techniques that we love so much and have changed our lives 
to more people because we know how accessible our methodology is. What you said there, I can sympathize with so, so much because we had a similar thing. It's like we used to film these things in high def, beautiful contrast and lighting. And then we go to COVID times and we're stuck with Zoom and webcams and all this stuff. So you definitely take a hit. We were filming on our iPhones during like the peak of quarantine. Yeah, you make do with what you have. And that's the, the beauty of it is that I think the world understands, especially now, like they just get it. They're okay with a loss in quality as long as the content is still there because everyone gets to your home and you're you're not going to have access to everything and all these high-end studio cameras and microphones and whatnot. But I wanted to ask you about when you scaled to a digital platform. I'm sure there were some challenges that came along with that that maybe you weren't prepared for. I mean, going from a brick and mortar, you don't have to deal with server space or uploading and tagging and and just running a website. Did you have to figure this all out on your own? Did you bring on a partner to help you with this? Like, how did you guys tackle going from analog to digital? I think we're still kind of tackling it. (laughs) We're still figuring it all out. But we, you know, for better, for worse, we made a decision before the pandemic, before even Sky Team TV to create a custom website. And we're lucky enough to work with a good friend who does website building. And so they've been not necessarily like an official partner, but I'd say probably like an unofficial partner because they definitely work hard for us and probably don't charge us as much as they would somebody they didn't know, but they've helped us tremendously on the back end just with figuring out and like also refreshing our website because the initial Skyting TV was like a first pancake. And then the pandemic came on and all of a sudden subscriptions were skyrocketing. And it was like, all of a sudden, all the little like things that were glitchy and like didn't quite work were like, oh, we need to fix this quick. And so we've gone through a few, you know, redrafts of it so far, and we're actually about to launch a bit of a rebrand starting next month. Coming but May anyway. 1st, 2021, wherever you're listening this from. <laughs> yeah, wherever you are. Hello from 2025, um, if you're listening <laughs> two years from now. No, but so they've helped a lot. And we've also started working with outside marketing people who have gotten us into more of the digital ad space and like upped our game as far as like just overall communication with our students and our customers and also acquiring and reaching bigger audiences, which I think for us has been the biggest learning curve is just like we are competing against giants, right? Like big corporate entities that have unlimited ad spend for digital subscription spaces. And so it's like for us, we're just trying to really carve our niche and show people what we're doing that's different. So to that point, and as Chrissy's joining us from Stanford Business School at the moment, have you Don't guys help done any- me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any funding? Like how did you guys go? Did you raise capital? Did you bootstrap? Where are you guys at in that whole process? We definitely bootstrapped up until now. And I think now we're at a place where like, okay, we can really pour some gasoline on this fire and get some funding and play with the big dogs. Like Peloton's ad spend last year, I think was $400 million. Guess what ours was? Not that. (laughs) But yeah, like we're in the place now where we're like, okay, we have enough subscribers. There's obviously a churn rate. So we have to keep acquiring new customers. But at the ad spend we're going it's like we can like maintain the same number so we're at a place now where we're like maybe interested in funding and like also perhaps trying out something else so we're always wanting to grow and change it up and like keep it fresh and right now we're at a position we're at a crossroads where we're just like figuring out our next move. I don't think the path is very clear yet. It's interesting. So during this time, we I've seen like a lot of companies, I'm sure you guys have to like Equinox, they, they created their own app and on their separate app, they have like all this amazing fitness training that they were offering for free for a little bit, but it was free if you remember. And it was like literally some of the best training ever. But the issue I thought was it's a complex problem because one, you're changing behavior, right? So you're moving somebody to an online setting which COVID has helped significantly with, but there's still a barrier there. And then two, the class better be damn good. And that's the hard part, right? And then I'm like, 
we actually had an Equinox trainer on the, on the podcast that she was filming a bunch of these things. And I was like, how often do you have to film? Like how many times do you have to go through these takes? Because you're, you're literally working out while you're coaching us, while there's four people in the room doing the same motions. And like, you're trying to tell me somebody didn't get tired. Like somebody definitely got tired and walked away. And so it creates this, it's hard. It's hard to keep that energy high in terms of how you guys view it. I just think about it. Like it's also an opportunity for young companies to almost show the behemoths how to do it. Right. So if you, if you guys, like it, it sounds like in your case, you're onto something, you know, you're onto something. And so the funding opportunity I would say is now because you have the right market signals at the same time, it's a cool, maybe opportunity to partner with a bigger player and say like, look, don't reinvent the wheel. We've already kind of figured this out. Yeah, we have the methodology and like the fun and like community dialed in. We need a Diego. We need a tech person to partner <laughs> with to just take care of all of the back end stuff that you have to continue to update. It's a never ending thing. Like technology changes so quickly and you really do have to keep up or if your load time is slow, people will go somewhere else even if you are the coolest, most fun yoga teachers in the world. Yeah, no, it's so true. But I'll it's... say something to that. I was going to say what's interesting with the pandemic and what it brought for us, you know, Chrissy said our early iterations of SkyTing TV videos that we launched with were like beautifully directed, had two cameras, you know, and like different shots, all edited, like really, really clean. We did voiceovers for the audio. So teachers weren't speaking live on camera. It was all like a really clean audio done in a sound studio, et cetera, et cetera. And those videos are great. And, you know, obviously they're still on our website, but what we got as far as feedback from students when the pandemic started, they were like, I kind of like these iPhone shot videos in your home better because you're like more yourselves. You're like laughing, you're making mistakes. And it feels like you're practicing with me as opposed to like being on this like pedestal of practice and then I think that's something that we've always done well at SkyTing is like really humanize the experience and it's not about like us being your guru or your ultimate teacher it's just like we are like you we're figuring our shit out just the way you're figuring your stuff out and like we're happy to go through this journey with you which I think brought like, especially during the pandemic and like the realities of the situation, like Chrissy said, we like, you know, live on levity and we live on bringing joy and trying to spark that within the yoga practice. And so that was an interesting learning lesson for us too. So now when we're in studios doing these classes, we are trying to keep it still a little more light, a little more real because the perfectionism that I think has existed for a long time in pre-recorded video space, especially with fitness, it's just kind of like, okay, that's cool for a while, but then it's boring. And like, I don't want to take somebody who doesn't make a mistake and who's like, you know, at a perfect angle with every posture. I want to see somebody that like flubs or needs to modify or like, yeah, I don't know, just is a human being. That's me. I'll flub all day. <laughs> you can be our next model. <laughs> I'll we'll be like the most, in. the most approachable yoga teacher right here. Exactly. Yeah. How to if get all the moves kind it. of right. Yeah, no, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> I'll embarrass myself. I don't mind at all. Chloe, what you were saying about people commenting on the, the change in, we like the iPhone videos because you're more yourself. I mean, that's kind of what we've been preaching on this show is like, you don't have to be perfect. Like that, to me, what that shows is growth. Like we were talking about earlier, you're hitting your stride and you're growing into this platform and you're getting better at it. You don't have to be perfect right away. You can allow time to figure things out as you go. The important thing is just to start. Whatever you're doing, just begin and learn along the way. That's part of the process it's, and it's a scary part because it's a big unknown. But by allowing for growth, you can really, I mean, you guys could come out of this and go back to the super interesting multi-camera angles shot in beautiful high definition and bring along with you the experience of shooting it at home on your iPhone, relatable content that everyone's going to just digest with fervor and really just hit a new level. So like looking forward, how do you think you guys can, can capitalize on this? And do you have plans for going back into a actual studio sometime in the future and kind of rolling back with the, the multi-camera angle productions? Yeah, I mean, 
that is what we're doing now. We're in studio with our, our fancy camera guy, Derek. Shout out. We love him. But we laugh because we're really one take wonders. We were like, let's keep the mistakes. Let's keep the cursing and no more voiceover. So that is what we learned. And looking forward, I think we'll just like keep refining and listening to our customers. Like we really are engaged with our people and our lifetime value of our customer is very very high compared to other subscription based models i think because you feel like we're talking directly to you we're listening to what you say your requests on instagram and they can like talk to the teachers directly we're always like on camera like hey guys dm me what class do you want to do next month so that's a thing and also we want to keep the sense of community and are doing these lo-fi <laughs> zoom classes weekly just to like see who's actually practicing with us that are just more for fun and not not anything else they're for free for now i'll share my, my number one sticky thing on these classes has been when i feel like the instructor's in my head like if i'm doing something for the third time and she'll say something like, I know it hurts, or like, I know this is the hardest one. And I'm like, how the fuck did she know? And <laughs> We're all psychic. It makes me connect. And so to your point around like voiceovers, like, I think that's great. Don't do it. Don't be the guy Raz of yoga. Don't get the orchestra. Just be you, just do it live. And it connects and it's so right. It feels so much better. Like I'm always like, yeah, she understands how hard it is. Like when she's losing her breath and I'm also sweating it's like, yes, she can't sound perfect. Cause then it would just be demoralizing to me. Like, how is she doing this while teaching and sounds perfect and I'm over here dying and I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just in my own room. It's weird. It has to be fresh. I mean, we, we teach these classes as if we have a live audience. We're trying to recreate the live studio experience through digital, which is was tricky, but I think you're right. We found our groove now. It took us, you know, <laughs> a year of learning, but we're in a good place, I think. What strategies do you guys use for like social media with Instagram and stuff? Have you guys done any influencer work? Do you feel like any of that actually helps? Do you feel like, like, what is the thing that you guys have found besides maybe just educating your viewers or your new followers on your approach? What has been like your lane that you guys have stuck to on social media? Well, our social media, like when we first started was, was really, really wacky. Like very fun, very weird, very little about yoga. So like maybe somebody coming from the streets would be like, what is this? Now, of course, we have streamlined a little bit, but you know, we've been shifting gears for social media and just testing out new things as of late, just to mix things up because it's like with anything, when you stick to a formula for too long, I think it starts to get a little stale or especially on Instagram, it can get, you know, just expect it and then you lose the attention. And so we're mixing up our formula as far as like what the content we're featuring. But I think for us, some of the biggest things that have helped have really been like partnering with brands that are of a similar like-minded audience. Like we did a big partnership with Sakara Life, which I don't know if you know them, but they're like a meal-based service across the US. They do, you know, healthy meals that you can order for like a short plan or a weekly plan or even a monthly plan. And that like initiative was great because it just exposed us to an audience that would definitely jive with Skyting, but maybe hadn't seen us before. So I think that has been really like a keystone for us. We were doing Instagram lives when the, the pandemic first started and like I think those go through fluctuations of people being interested in being on Instagram more and then people being like, I hate Instagram. I don't want to, you know, be on it any longer than I have to. Like my little monster scroll is going to let me. And so I don't know. I think you just have to be in constant pivot on social media because like the wants and the needs are ever shifting. Now we're trying to get into TikTok and like it's Chrissy and I like grandmas trying to figure out how to do all of the cool things on TikTok that we really don't understand, but we're going to try. We're we're still we're still in learning mode for that. And I think to add on the same thing applies to Instagram in that like the more real we are, the higher the engagement is. Like when we have like pristine photography, it's it's like cute photo but like when we're ourselves and we're making jokes and we're like doing like bloopers behind the scenes like those are the things that really work for our audience 
That's so true. All that stuff, being authentic is so much better. It's such a weird thing. It's but so it's, much better. It's like my wife will post pictures with like funny faces of, on construction sites on her stories. And I'm like, that's so great. Like, I'm like, it's, <laughs> cause it's so true. You I'll know? follow that. That sounds fun. <laughs> it's just, it's great. It's hilarious. How much is your subscription? What do you guys charge on a monthly basis? We're actually launching with our like rebrand at the very start of May. It'll be shifting to a sliding scale for pricing between $20 and $30. So you can pick your mark in that range. And the initiative we're doing with that is that at the 25 or over mark, we're going to be doing a give back subscription. So for everyone who subscribes and chooses $25 or more for their monthly subscription, we'll be giving a subscription away in tandem with that. So, you know, it's like, We've been trying to figure out, it's like, we're a yoga studio, we have values that like kind of supersede the capitalist system, we want to build in, you know, things that are important to us, which includes getting wellness and getting these tools and techniques to larger groups of people that have been left out of the conversation. And so we're about to launch it, we'll let you know how it goes. How many classes do I get for 25 or 30 a month? Is there a limit? Or is it just uh, the whole no, library? It's all of them. The whole library, as well as our Zoom classes, we have four Zoom live Zooms a week. Plus, we upload that seems ten cheap. plus classes every right? month. It's, it's like a blockbuster. It lately. is like it seems very, very cheap, very affordable. I guess is the word. Considering yes. one class in New York before this was twenty five dollars. So right? for yeah. twenty five dollars a month, you're getting access to two hundred videos in our library plus the live Zoom classes. Plus, you're giving a subscription away to someone who doesn't have wellness practices. So we think it's a great model and you guys should subscribe. hundred percent. This is Masterclass did that during the pandemic. They were giving away a subscription if you signed up. And so it was like such a smart thing because it was a genius for Masterclass and for you guys to be doing it. So, so you guys must get, be getting ready to raise capital, I would imagine. I mean, you launch this, you're, I would imagine your very next step is to say, look, we, our, user has, our users have tripled. I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. We saw, we were like watching the numbers rise, like May, whatever it was, 15th. We we're like, okay, online seems to be going well. <laughs> so we just, yeah, we have to keep going with it and pour more energy into the online thing. But we do want to get back. We're such live in person people. And we used to do retreats all over the world and classes all over. So we are going to be doing some in-person stuff if you are based in and around New York. But that will be now our side hustle. Yeah. It switched. That's really smart. I mean, I think about this from like a, a different type of strategy. From a strategy perspective, it's almost like we saw brick and mortar. We know the limitations of doing that. It's slow. It's hard to scale. Now you're moving to tech while you guys build out the platform, what's really cool is like you can just have these like pop-ups almost where you can literally say, hey guys, we're gonna be in Chicago this week. And all of a sudden you're like in the most beautiful spaces in, in the country, putting on these events that speak heavily to your user base, but are also just super cool, right? And so you can record it and now you have better content and you can do like a fun class. And it's just like, hey, yoga outside instead of yoga in the studio. But Obviously the audio, like Nick's an audio guy. And so the audio would be not as good. He would go crazy. However, it's that honest, transparent layer of like, yeah, there is traffic, but here we are. A drop of water is enough to carve a stone, right? <laughs> I like that through line of this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, any audio experience will be better than like our Chinatown location with like right by the fire department. <laughs> Do you guys send anything to your users? Like, is there, I'm just thinking from branding, is there like a certain, maybe some clothing you guys send or, or like a welcome thing? Is there something that people get as members? We thought about doing that. We don't have the bandwidth right now to like have a big merch component, but that could be next too. We thought about doing like a starter pack, like you get your Sky Ting mat and your two blocks and like your subscription. So that could definitely be something that maybe is already out there, depending on when you're listening to this. But yeah, for sure. Or like a water bottle. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, there's so many branding opportunities here for whatever it might be. Like, just like Diego was saying, like pay for the subscription. And then a week later in the mail comes a Sky Ting yoga block or a, a water bottle or yoga mat. It's kind of in line with like what Peloton does. Like, you know, you're using the Peloton app, but you also got the Peloton bike. It's just all 
uh, vertical integration, as they say. Love a vertical. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the sexiest thing there is. So hot. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward, are there any lofty goals that you guys could be willing to share with us as for where you see Sky Ting in maybe five, ten years from now? I mean, our vision for Sky Tang continuously changes as we change and our proclivities change, but we want to reach more people. We really want to close the wellness gap. We want to reach people, like Chloe said, who are not always included in the conversation of wellness. And so definitely continue on with our online stuff, but I have dreams to create a retreat center one day. I love design, I love spaces, I love creating communities, so that could perhaps be something that you'll see down the line. Just off the top of my head, and piggybacking off both what you and Diego was talking about earlier about doing these pop-ups, I mean, why settle on one retreat when you could have retreats all over the country that you just kind of come in, you set up for a month, and then you move on, like set up in some beautiful locations like, you know, Park City, Utah in the summer or Boulder, Colorado or Aspen, uh, like I mean, Aspen, you know, you go to the Catskills in New York, uh, just, you know, really explore the country and invite your user base to join you for these retreats and everyone can tune in for the live zoom sessions we do those retreats we used to do 12 a year and that was like it's the most fun way to teach yoga you're like on vacation you have time you know no one's in a rush class could be 45 minutes or two hours it doesn't matter so we love hosting retreats and and we will definitely be doing some more pop-ups but yeah, that's like for teachers, the big bonus of being a yoga teacher is like having the freedom to explore the world and get paid to teach. Well, listen, guys, this has been amazing. Great talking to both of you. Can you just let everyone know where they can find you? It's just real simple. Skyting, S-K-Y-T-I-N-G dot com or on Instagram at Skyting and your venturing into TikTok at SkyTing as well. <laughs> Chrissy, Chloe, thanks for coming on the podcast. This has been great. I appreciate it. Thank you. You guys Thank are you. awesome. Super fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, pleasure talking with you both.